introduction and uh, maybe I'm a little speechless, that's really kind. And thank you for the um, impromptu congratulatory um, a note to the seminar. Um, we just found out about this and anything yesterday, so it's really kind of you to advertise that and to, um, to do this. And to come back from Stanford where you were giving a talk, leaving the talk early and coming back, so thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak today about research that actually goes back to the time that Alex talked about at Stanford when he was a student and about the work that we've been doing since then and more recently in um, under trying to characterize and understand safety and more recently understand it in the context of machine learning. And um, I think this is, this is really timely now because um, machine learning is going to be used in control. It's going to be used, it's being used, and we don't know how to make any kinds of assurances about it yet. Um, yet it's out there and it's being used. And I think that um, it's one of, uh, in terms of my career, it feels like one of the most exciting times to work in this general area of autonomy. Because there are um, so many cool, hard problems to work on and they're so important and things are changing very quickly, and it's not just in the university, it's out in companies, and it's out in, in society, people are using these systems. Um, and so, it, and it, it requires kind of bringing together different uh, communities, uh, working with, you know, different specializations. And so, um, so I, I, um, I feel like, you know, where we're coming from, we're very much a, um, you know, control, model-based background, and, um, and so we bring that perspective and perhaps we bring that bias into the problems that we're working on. Um, but to be able to solve the problems we need to solve, we need to be able to incorporate into that learning. Maybe not learning models, but we need to be able to learn about environments and we need to learn quickly and in real time and we need to make some kinds of guarantees about that. I don't know how to do that yet and this talk um, you know, it's called Safe Learning in Robotics. It probably should be called Towards Safe Learning in Robotics. That's what we always do when we haven't solved something, but we've made a step. Um, because it's um, maybe just some uh, first steps towards that. Um, so in this talk, what I thought I'd do is start by talking about safety and going back to the time Alex was a student and talking about reachability, which is a tool that we've been working on in my group for a long time talking about some of the recent progress in that, um, that others um, who were here in the room have been working on, um, and then move towards um, integrating learning uh, near the end of the talk and, and really just show some, some recent results. Okay, so, so I, um, I come from a background where um, I've done a lot of work with air traffic control systems. And, um, and again, this is a very exciting time in air traffic control because um, this is a, a system that is typically, you know, to make some progress in changing and developing systems in air traffic control, such a safety critical system, very conservative, rightly so. So, you know, things um, progress slowly and things are certified and that's the right way to do things. But I would say over the past 10 to 15 years, um, things have been changing. And one of the reasons, and the speed of things that have been changing, um, around different uses of the, um, of the airspace. And one reason for that are kind of these business pushes towards um, integrating smaller aircraft like and autonomous aircraft into the air traffic management system. And, and so, you know, this slide is just sort of pointing to a couple of those cases where, um, you know, in terms of an air traffic control system, in terms of, you know, all the freeways in the sky and the structure that exists, one of the problems that NASA and the FAA are very interested in is how do we update that system to allow flexible flight of UAVs? Probably, you know, segregated airspace, that makes sense. But how do we design an air traffic system for UAVs, unmanned air vehicles? And, um, and so, you know, that's, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of design considerations, but it's, it's a, a little bit of a more flexible problem. And, and we've worked on a couple of problems with NASA about this. Um, one of the questions has been, 
how might you use kind of the you know the jetways that the jetway structure that exists for air traffic control? How might you try to replicate that for a UAV system if you were designing an air traffic management system for UAVs from scratch? So you know safety is paramount. Simplicity also important in any system where um, there's humans interfacing with automation and where the control authority is shared between humans and automation. You want to be able to have clear control and clear automation that in most cases is well understood by the people that are interfacing with it. Um, and, um, and then also, you know, it's, it's a wonderful area for integrating learning because these systems are unmanned. They are, um, you know, they'll probably be remote pilots um, in some cases, but in, in most cases they're flying autonomously or semi-autonomously. And so they have to be able to adapt to new information and, and, um, and you know, be able to perceive the environment and make um, decisions autonomously based on that. So, you know, one uh, point of view, and this is kind of a diagram that um, comes from um, a, a project that we worked on. This is um, a model, it's a, it's a hybrid model, and it's a, a model of an aircraft under the control of air traffic. One of the questions we were asking is um, this, this kind of control mode structure of an aircraft. Should we try to maintain that when we're thinking about control of UAVs under this new unmanned air system traffic management? And now we kind of really go back to the old days because the person who actually, what one of the things he did during his PhD was actually, of, of many, was a wonderful project um, where <laughs> he, um, Alex, spent um, a lot of time sitting behind air traffic controllers, watching what they were doing, recording what they were doing. This is when you could actually go into the air traffic control centers and do this, and then developed this, you know, data-driven model of air traffic control with all these, I haven't shown all the details, but they're basically different modes that controllers use when they're trying to route now, these are these are aircraft and air traffic control. Aircraft through sectors of airspace. So yeah, maybe there's two things you should notice about this picture. Um, one is that I I look a lot younger than I do now. I was thinking about that this afternoon. The second is that Alex is exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> the same amount of time has passed. How does that work? <laughs> so one of the questions then is how much structure can we bring over from what we know how to do already in air traffic control? Um, and, and as we've said before, this is a very exciting time in this field. There's lots of different applications of economy. These are just two companies that um, two of the students from my research group worked at last summer on internships, Skydio and Euro, and they're both autonomous vehicle companies, both really cool companies. Um, but you know, these systems are being deployed and they have to be safe. Okay, so, so as I said, I'm gonna spend the first part of the talk talking about reachability, and um, I'll, 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 I'll give a, a little background, but I'll focus on the more recent work we've been doing in one of the key issues here, which is alleviating the computational burden in um, computing these reachable sets. And then um, we'll um, spend the end of the talk talking about how one might integrate learning into these reachability computations. So that's what I meant when I said maybe a first step towards safe learning. Um, the backwards reachable set. So, so the idea here is conceptually, I think it's kind of intuitive. Suppose you have a system and you have a model of that system. And suppose you can, so that, and that system has dynamics. So you have a model of those dynamics, how it changes over time, how the states, how it evolves, how it moves, like an aircraft moving through space, or, you know, we've done a lot of work on collision avoidance systems, so how, you know, groups of aircraft evolve. And how they move. Um, so suppose you could characterize what it means to be unsafe as a subset of the system state space. All right, so an aircraft flying has to stay within its aerodynamic flight envelope. Um, an aircraft collision avoid every pair of aircraft has to maintain a specified safe distance from, um, from each other or you know, every other aircraft. And so if you could and so sort of conceptualize just with this continuous system, this continuous differential equation to begin with. Um, suppose you could represent unsafety here as the set. So this it's this like stylized ellipse in the state space, which is the slide of the system. 
then if you had a model of the system, which we do, this is the dynamics of the system, and we can, we, can, um, we can make it quite interesting. We can have control inputs, things that you or the autopilot or the automation can control, disturbances. So those are things that you can't control. Maybe they're the actions of another aircraft, um, which you don't know what they're going to do, but you assume there's some bound on those actions. Then, um, what a, a backwards reachable set is, it's um, parameterized by time, and it's the set of all states for which, for all possible control actions, there's a disturbance action which, under the dynamics of that system, could cause the system state to get into that unsafe set G of zero in at um, most T time units. Okay, so as time progresses, you can calculate this sort of pink, pinkish set, the set of states which could enter that unsafe region despite the best possible control action. Um, and, and this kind of, um, the, you know, the best control for the worst disturbance, that leads us to thinking about a game, a, a game between you know, the things you can control and the things you can't control, which we'll just call disturbances. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is a set. We characterize it, we call it G of T, so the backwards reachable set. We're, it's backwards because we don't, or we either, you know, we can compute this for desired regions too, but we either don't want to or we want to end up in a set. And we're trying to figure out, like, what we should do now or what we shouldn't do now so that we either, you know, get into the set or we avoid that. Um, okay, so now comes um, some of the work that Alex did when he was a graduate student, and his name is, uh, so this was uh, Ian Mitchell and Alex were, Ian was uh, uh, one of my first PhD students, Alex was maybe like third, maybe third, fourth, third. well you all graduated at exactly we the same time. We had a lot of seconds. Time. Yeah, that's true. Um, so um, this is a, a statement which basically says that that set can be, um, can be characterized. And uh, I mean, under assumptions, so this is, uh, you know, we're looking at that um, differential equation model, and we basically say that that reachable set can be characterized as the sub-zero level sets of a function, and the evolution of that function can be computed through an algorithm which solves a, a Hamilton-Jacobi partial differential equation. So this is, um, it's something that was, you know, in general, the, the idea of solving a Hamilton-Jacobi Jacobi PDE is something that's been well known in the literature. Um, Craig Evans, who's a professor here in math, was key in formulating this problem. We kind of turned it around for these reachability problems and asked, you know, how do you compute sets that states um, that could get into a set? And so we had some modifications based on that, but it's basically um, a reuse and an adaptation building on known tools. And the idea is kind of a, it's like a, we can think of it iteratively, and in a sense, when we do the computation, it is iterative. But we're basically looking at, you know, under those dynamics, if the vector fields are pushing you towards that set, then in the next time step backwards, you're going to start characterizing more and more of that part of the state space as unsafe. And, um, and you can compute these back to sometimes a fixed point, but usually not a fixed point for interesting dynamics. You just compute them back and they stop do it for, you know, 10 seconds or one minute over some finite time horizons. Okay, and it's a, a level set. So these sets are represented, this is important, the sets are represented implicitly as level sets of a function. We call that J of X T. So at every time T, the set itself are those states such that J of X T, those states X such that J of X T is less than or equal to zero, and we are propagating this function J. So that, that's kind of an interesting point of view. You're, you're characterizing and, the compu and computing the sets implicitly by characterizing and computing the higher dimensional function. And so what happens is you, know, you start off with some set, and then as you propagate in time, you're just recording the zero level set, or the sub-zero level sets. OK, so let's, um, so that's a little bit of a, a background. Now, a few things to say that are interesting for later. If the set is controlled invariant for all t, so if that computation stops and um, after some time, meaning that as you progress time, the set doesn't get any bigger, then any super zero level set is also invariant 
and may be used for safety. So what do we mean by that? Basically that if you stay outside of a super zero level set, then you're guaranteed to stay outside of the zero level set itself. So um, that may be useful. Um, and then the other thing, which is sort of intuitive, is that the more you know about the uncertainties or disturbances in the system, the less conservative this set becomes. So this, that means, like, the more you know about what the disturbance is doing, the less it becomes a disturbance, the more you can model it, and then you can become less conservative in that set that's, you know, as small as possible. But typically, even if you knew the disturbance perfectly, even if there were no disturbance, there is going to be some set, right? Because, you know, imagine you're, you're, um, you're biking along and you're trying to avoid a tree. You, there's, if you get too close to the tree, there's nothing you can do just because of the dynamics of the system. Okay, so um, this is the, there's a toolkit that Ian Mitchell developed. Um, he's now a professor in computer science at UBC in Vancouver. And, um, and you can actually download the toolbox. There's a bunch of examples. It's really well documented. And you can switch out his dynamics and those examples for your own. And you can compute these sets in a you know, fairly reasonable uh, time. Um, and, and since then, there's, um, there's been a, quite a bit of development in our group here, actually run by Sylvia, who's standing over there, who's developed a lot of interesting wrappers to go around the toolbox to make it really easy to use, to add in new dynamics, and to do new functionality. Okay, so this just shows an example of one of the old examples that we worked on. Um, and you can see this is the function, this is j of xp, and we're taking the sub zero level set. So it's got a couple of really cool things, right? The boundary of the region, as we talked about, is defined implicitly by those states x such that j equates to zero. Um, the norm of j, we're using a sine distance function to propagate, to, then that norm represents some kind of distance from, if you're at any state x at time t, the distance to the boundary whether you're inside the set or outside of the set. That can be useful information for control um, that you can use as your design and controllers based on this. Okay, so this is an example. This is Stanford, where you just were. Um, I think that field is still there, but I'm not sure. There's an underground parking structure now. But the field is still there. The field is still there, that's right. So these are four, and you can see the quad rotors, right? You now, now, like, this was in the age where you couldn't go to every street corner and buy a quad rotor. So we had to build our own. So these are kind of, we did the, we actually did the circuit boards. And we did, these are carbon fiber tubing that we strapped together. And in both these, they're called um, STARMAC, the Stanford Test Bed of Autonomous Rotorcraft for Multi-Agent Control, STARMAC. Um, we moved them up to Berkeley, but they still maintain that STARMAC um, name because it sounded better than um, Barmac, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's like KFC, it's not Kentucky Fried Chicken. So what we're showing here is, a, is an experiment we did. There are four students, and they're flying the four quadrotors around. They're joysticking them around. And, um, and uh, you see the play out of the data on the right. So each vehicle has three sets around it. Each of those three sets is a collision avoidance zone that we've computed with respect to one of the other aircraft. So each um, vehicle is simultaneously computing its backwards reachable set with respect to the current state of the other vehicle. And you can see that you know, the sets are growing in length and they're changing you know, orientation. That's because the vehicles are moving around and they're going faster and slower and they're changing orientation. So what happens is, as soon the, the students are trying to crash the vehicles, but as soon as one vehicle gets to the boundary of its reachable set with respect to another, the automation takes over, the automation on board the vehicle, and guides the vehicles away from each other. So that's the, what it, what it uses is that control law, which is computed via that hamilton jacobi computation. All right, so it's a really bad human factors example because um, after, some, after guiding them away from each other, after some time, the control is given back to the student and they kind of have to joystick it around to figure out when they get the control back. But it's just an, a, a, an implementation to show the use of these reachable sets. Okay, and as I said before, you can do other things with this. You can compute, you know, you can switch the problem around and compute all states for which you can get to a desired region despite the worst possible disturbance. And in terms of the hamilton jacobi equation, that's just um, you know, the min and the max, the, the, what the control is doing and what the disturbance is doing, their, their actions have flipped. So same code, same computation, just that switch. And you can sequence things. 
So this is um, interesting for hybrid systems where we have um, we have a, a bunch of different modes of behavior, and you may be switching from one mode to the other and then following a different continuous trajectory. Um, but you may want to, for example, reach a target set in one particular mode of operation. Um, but to do that, you have to, first of all, get from um, you know, a mode that you're in to that, um, the, what's called the capture basin, the, the set of states, the backwards reachable set for which you can reach the target set, and then, um, and then apply the control to get to the target set. And you can do that simultaneously uh, while avoiding um, unsafe sets. So you can uh, compute this, what we call the reach avoid operator, the set of states from which you can reach a desired set while avoiding an unsafe set. Basically doing, um, it's like uh, doing a kind of masking of this level set computation. Um, okay, so here's an example of uh, that I kind of motivated the talk with, which is the use of uh, unmanned air vehicles and in designing an air traffic system for unmanned air vehicles. Um, to call this example two. And this is some, um, this is an example where, uh, so we were working with NASA, and they were interested in understanding how you could com um, quickly generate routes and, and reroute if necessary for um, UAVs that were, for example, doing some kind of package delivery. It didn't really matter what the application was. They were interested in routing, and they were interested in thinking about real-time uh, separation, safe separation between aircraft and routes. And so this is just a, an example of one of the results. There's um, a warehouse in Concord that uh, the UAV operator is delivering packages from. And um, we're computing routes to several different points in the Bay Area. And we put a cost map over the Bay Area. So yellow is water. We've given that a fairly low cost, like it's cheaper to fly over water. That may not be what you want to do, but this is just an example that we tried. Um, the heavily populated areas uh, where the cities are, those are kind of expensive to fly over. Wooded areas are a bit cheaper. So, you know, cheap, cheaper, more expensive. And then the most expensive are the areas around airports. So you basically want to have like minimal uh, penetration to those sets to get into. I mean, you have to get in there, but, but minimize the amount of time you're in those spaces. And so this is just, a, you know, setting up the cost and doing a fast marching method to compute the shortest paths. And what was neat is that when you do that, you see this kind of root structure emerging, which is something that we see in air traffic control, right? This kind of uh, highways in the sky root structure. But you would have trunk routes, which makes sense, over the cheapest areas, like the water in our case, and then fairly short deviations, so branches off to go to the points of interest. So with that structure, we thought, why don't we um, think about a kind of, you know, like Alex did, a kind of, um, control system, a hybrid control system for a UAV now under this autonomous control, thinking about this highways in the sky structure. And so, um, and motivated by the, the platooning in the California PATH project, which um, has been a really inspirational project that was, you know, led here at Berkeley um, well, for, for, for decades, um, which is, um, you know, automating the interlane of California's highways. We thought about platoons of, um, of UAVs basically having these platoons all flying at the same speed of UAVs along these front routes with short <coughs> um, The nice thing about that is that you're, you're basically turning um, a lot of aircraft into just a few aircraft. So groups of aircraft all flying at the same velocity. So it's easier to manage when we think about the simplicity of incorporating humans in the And so, you know, this is just part of the hybrid system, but there's a, a free mode, so it's not in a platoon or on a highway. It, it goes on to a highway, then it can be a leader of a platoon, or it can be a follower of a platoon. If it's itself with no other vehicles, it's just a leader of its own platoon. Um, and then we use the altitude for the fault modes here, for, for some of the fault modes. And so each of these has a well-defined controller, and what's interesting is to think about how to generate the guards of the transitions from one mode to another. And that's what we've used reachability for. So using um, you know, fairly realistic models of these aircraft, we computed the reach avoid operators for these vehicles, snapping them to highways, um, uh, joining a platoon, and automatically generated those guards in that hybrid system model. Okay, so here's some examples. This is an example of two vehicles doing a merge and join on the highway. So there's a red vehicle, the red dot, and a blue vehicle, the blue dot. 
Um, and uh, I think I'll show this one because I can reach it. So here the red vehicle is already joined the highway and the blue vehicle is about to join the highway. This is its reach set and that's its avoid set. The avoid set is with respect to the motion of the other vehicle. And we're assuming that it can sense the position of the other vehicle and can you know, capture what it's doing. And that can either be through sensing or it's through some ground information system. Okay, so, so then it gets, once it gets into that reach set, there's a simple controller that snaps it onto its moving target on the highway. And so this, um, you can sort of see if you put in a number of vehicles all following this kind of reach avoid calculation, which is done automatically, you get this organic um, motion of the quad rotors or whatever vehicle we're using. Here we're using um, seven dimensional models of quad rotors for each to get onto the highway. We're just not showing the sets here, but they're computed in the background. If a vehicle, like an intruder, for example, flies through and it's not following the rules, as long as that's detected, which is a really challenging problem, but as long as that's detected, <coughs> vehicles can sense um, you know, the avoid set, and as it starts to pass through, they depart the highway and then only get back when they pass the avoid set. So, so they're leaving their control law as soon as they touch the boundary of that vegetable set. Okay, so, so that's, you know, the big deal here has been, um, and I alluded to this before, has been doing these computations. And, and this is, you know, at heart, we're doing Hamilton-Jacobi equations, so we're using a kind of dynamic programming-like algorithm subject to the cursive dimensionality. And it's the cursive dimensionality in the state space of the system. So if you have, you know, a, a seven-dimensional vehicle, it's got seven dimensions in its state space, and you have to grid up the state space to solve that, so our, the computation is based on gridding the state space and solving for that function at each point in the grid, so it's exponential, the computation is exponential in the number of state dimensions. And then if you think about collision avoidance among multiple vehicles, the state space grows and grows. Um, so we've been, and not just us, I mean, there's been a lot of work in the kind of community um, in a variety of communities thinking about how to do this computation more efficiently. Um, let me just say a few words about two projects that we work on. One which um, involves the work of Sylvia and others in the group. And that's the idea of uh, decomposing systems. So you know, just as an illustration, I'll use this, but we, um, we, we define self-contained subsystems. So you have a, say a, a high dimensional differential equation. Um, in general, this is not an example. It's not a high dimensional differential equation. We'll just use it for illustration purposes. It's three dimensions, x, y, and theta. It's a Jupin's car model. Um, and so you can, I, and we can do this in real time, just compute the reachable set for that system or a collision avoid, uh, a reach avoid set for that, for that system with another system and do the 3D computation. But we can also do something else with this. We could break it down into two two dimensional subsystems. And, and then the neat thing here, so we call these self contained subsystems. What self-contained means is that everything you need to compute the solutions for the state variables are on the right-hand side of the differential equation. So what's interesting is that there can be overlap in variables between the subsystems. You have to take that into account when you stitch it back together. But you're allowed to have overlap, which makes the problem of determining these subsystems and then doing those low-dimensional computations in parallel much easier. Okay, so, so in this case, again, you know, this is just an example, but now we're doing two two-dimensional computations instead of one three-dimensional computation. And that's faster. I mean, you, it becomes much faster if you think in higher dimensions. So the idea is you, you take the set, you, you have to have some kind of representation of what the set looks like so that you can do this. You project, this is the, for example, the avoid set, the set you want to avoid. You project it down into the state space, the the dimensions in the subsystems. Um, and so you, and then you take the intersections of those back projections to represent the site you're interested in. And then you do the computation in the subsystems. So you do two two-dimensional computations, maintaining that intersection of the back projection. Um, compute that, compare it to uh, the direct computation, and in many cases, which we've characterized, you can get an exact reconstruction of the set. Okay, 
So in this case, the complexity went down one dimension, which is nice, but in general, we've used these for higher dimensional systems. So here's a 6D full system, which was broken down into two two-dimensional subsystems. Now, like viewing the set becomes interesting. Yeah, so basically what we have to do is, in the different projections of the state variable, we take slices of those. And you know, often you don't have to stitch the set together. You've got the information you need in the individual projections. Here's an example where you couldn't compute this um, completely. It's a 10-dimensional quad-order, dynamic quad-order model in near hover mode. And we broke that down into three computations, two 3D subsystems and one 1D subsystem. OK, and so again, the, the um, the visualization and the use of the set is another challenge, but it's a promising technique for a class of systems where you want the details of a reachable set, but you don't have the computational power to do the full thing. You can do these computations in subsystems. Um, another project that we've worked on in this area of efficient computation is to exploit offline computation as much as possible. offline computation as much as possible. So, um, never travel without a, a backup. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I've learned. Project that we've been working on in the past few years, where we're using reachability in real time to be able to um, effectively produce safe plans for robot systems. So um, this is a, a kind of example where we thought, could we try to do some of this reachability computation offline and then use it online? So exploiting offline computation. You know, it, the paradigm in control, in, in optimal control, has been, and I, I know many of you are aware of this, that you, you, you want to avoid, you want to plan a path, you want to avoid these obstacles. Um, so you compute an optimal control law for this model that you have of the dynamic system, because the dynamic system is a real model, it's typically slow to compute. And this is different from what is done um, largely in the robotics community, where very simple, usually just point mass models are used of robots, and then very fast plans which exploit those simple models are computed, like RRT, for example, is a, a great example of something that's widely used. Um, and that you're planning with very simple dynamics, you can do it very quickly, uh, may not capture all the system behavior, um, but it's fast, however, it's not necessarily robust to disturbances or obstacles. So even though you plan a path, the one that you actually track, the red line, might actually come into contact with obstacles. So we could take this reachable set, if we knew the difference between a simple model, 
and a high dimensional model, which we do, we can compute that relative model, we can compute a reachable set based on those relative dynamics, pre-compute that, and then have the planner carry that reachable set around with it when it's planning in real time on the low dimensional model. And so that's the proposal, is to pre-compute this tracking error bound using reachability and then use it. So um, this is a, an idea that are, um, and, and sort of a representation of this. And, and you can use kind of a lot of the nice um, tools of reachability. So you can use um, the planning system as the kind of disturbance system. Um, it's, uh, it's trying to like maximize the cost and the, the tracking system is trying to get to the planner. So it's that kind of control interpretation. And then you capture this maximum cost of the time. So it's a backwards reachable set calculation. Maybe it's a little clearer to see it in this animation. So suppose you had, for example, a sine distance function, and you had maybe three specified distances. These are the distances that I want to maintain between myself and you know, the you know, possible obstacles that could occur in the system. So I want to make sure that I can stay within those distance bounds. Then you just take those slices, and here are the reachable set computations. What you're computing is the maximal controlled invariant set for those given distances. So what this says is that you know for this distance, which was way down here, there's no guarantee that you can stay inside the set if these are the, the relative dynamics you're using. And we're using in this example for this computation a diff, like a, a four-dimensional uh, uh, quadrotor model, which is tracking a two-dimensional. And, um, and in these, uh, for these distances, you get some set within that that you can stay within. Okay, so just to look at that. Um, so now here in this example, it's a, that 10D quadrotor again, which is tracking a 3D point source. And so what it's doing is using RRT, um, rapidly exploring random trees as the planner, so very fast on that 3D model, but it's maintaining that tracking error bound, which is shown it's a projection of a 10-dimensional set down into those three dimensions. And so it's basically saying that the tracking system is always guaranteed to stay within that tracking area. And you can use that as it, you know, in this case, it's just simulation, but it's detecting those obstacles in real time, trying to get to the goal on the right-hand side of the page. Okay, so, so we call this fast track, or fast and safe tracking. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of a, a neat paradigm. It differs from the typical thing, which is to plan a path and then use an LQR controller around that to make sure you track the path well. You're not guaranteed you're going to stay within a tracking error bound for that. But with fast track, you can. And you can do other things, too. You can maintain multiple models of the system. So, you know, a, a, a very simple model for when you're planning in wide open spaces and then a more detailed model when you want to go down narrow corridors and then switch between these. And because it's a reachability computation, you can figure out exactly when you, sh you, can't, you should switch to maintain safety so that you don't hit any of the obstacles. And so we, we've flown this on the quadrotor. Actually, we've, we've done a number of experiments. This is something that Joe um, Menke did with, um, with the folks that he's collaborated with, Jesse Patterson and Ji Han and Alan Yang, um, applying a fast track in an AR-VR setting, so coming up with a very simple path that the person wearing the AR-VR equipment just gives the waypoints, and then fast track will basically compute the path for the quadrotor to track that. So let me just um, unfortunately skip that in the interest of time and um, talk about one other way we use fast track, which is um, ensuring um, safe motion of these robotic systems around people using them. Okay, so, so now here we have, and this is just a stylized picture, a quadrotor and a person. And the quadrotor wants to be able to plan a path, but it doesn't, it wants to figure out what the person is most likely to do because it wants to avoid the person. And so the, you know, we can do fast track for this, but the missing thing here is a model of what the person is going to do. And so there, there's been quite a lot of work in um, kind of the mathematical psychology communities and also in the robotics communities on, um, predicting what people are going to do in various scenarios. And in this scenario, we were focused on kind of indoor lab environments, um, people moving around the environment. And, um, and so we use this idea, it's, it's a, 
It's a model based on, I mean, it's an old uh, distribution. This is the Boltzmann distribution. And, um, and so what this is is saying that the probability of that person taking a given action is exponentially more likely to happen if um, the person is, the action that that person is taking is making it more efficient for a particular goal. Okay, so it assumes that the person has a set of, a goal or a set of goals, a set of known goals, like in this case the person might be going to the door, and then it computes based on that. All right, so this is a kind of representing the spread of that Boltzmann distribution and the regions of high probability and low probability. So this would be probably this or this, these two would be the actions that have much higher probability than that action. And so that's, that's something that we can compute. And moreover, there's a parameter here, beta, this kind of inverse temperature parameter in the Boltzmann distribution, which you, it's a single parameter and you can use that, you can update that in real time. So as the quad rotor is watching what the person is doing, if the person starts to do something that looks irrational towards that goal, they can you know, update that parameter and basically make that distribution reflect the fact that that person is acting more irrational. So, um, so this is uh, you know, sort of in the stylized picture. Suddenly that person forgets their keys and they turn around to go get them and the distribution, so the, uh, the quad rotor observes that and says, well, the action that that person is taking is not efficient towards the goal so the distribution starts to spread out. And so what you're learning here is only one parameter. So it can be done in real time. Okay, so, so here's Sylvia. She's a human being. <laughs> and um, there we go. Okay, so, yeah. Good. So we'll um, talk through this in a second, but the quad rotor is trying to plan a path to its goal while avoiding Sylvia, who's moving around the lab. Um, now, Sylvia is moving um, towards the door, but she's avoiding a coffee spill on the ground, which the robot doesn't know about. So that kind of, as she starts to move to avoid that coffee spill, she becomes a little more irrational. She's moving away from the sort of straight path towards her goal. And if we look back at the kind of top-down view of these distributions, we'll just run through that again so you can see it. So we have the quad rotor on the left. It's planned the path. It's following that using fast track. There's Sylvia walking. You see all this stuff coming out of her. That's the distribution. That's the Boltzmann distribution representing the next few steps that she plans to take. So now we'll look at the top down view. So you see that as Sylvia starts to avoid, the quad rotor makes her much more irrational. That distribution spreads out, and the quad rotor replans its path to avoid her distribution. Okay, and so we've, we've worked on that. We've extended it to multiple people. So now this is um, Jaime, who in general is a more irrational person than Sylvia. So he's causing a lot. And you can see he's kind of dancing. The quadrator really thinks that he's irrational. He always has a bigger distribution than she does. Um, but basically now we're doing like multiple quad rotors, moving around with multiple people. We're using, um, for the quad rotors, we know what they're going to do. So we can plan, you know, multiple quad rotor paths, and we use an algorithm that we've developed called sequential trajectory planning with priorities for that. But the, the, um, the prediction of what people are going to do, we just use the single person mm -hmm. prediction here, even though they cross paths. And the fact that they kind of stop, you know, they meet each other and they stop a little bit, they just become more irrational. So the distribution naturally spreads out without, without us doing anything more. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are running out of time, and so I'm just going to say two words about integrating learning into this reachability framework. So we talked about the basics of reachability. We talked about a number of examples. We talked about computation. So how, you know, different things to do to um, think about um, sub, uh, these subsystem decompositions, to do the computation faster. We talked about doing things offline, like in fast track and how we've used that. Um, so maybe I'll end with coming back to this point of view. If you're using machine learning in an autonomous system, it kind of makes sense to use as much of like, modeling as you can. If you, you typically know the system that you're controlling. You, you have models of it. Um, you know something about the environment, some structure of the environment. You, don't, you probably don't know everything, and that's, that's the problem. 
Um, but, but this combination of using models and then learning the differences, sort of learning updates on those models, uh, learning the disturbance functions better is something that we started with. And so we asked, how might we, um, while maintaining safety, learn those disturbance functions in real time and then use that to make the control either less conservative or more conservative if we learn that it's different than we thought it was to be. So rather than talk about the details, I'm going to show you a video. Okay. Um, and this is a, an experiment we did with our quad motor in the lab. We just wanted, it was doing something simple, just step trajectory, up and down, up and down. Um, its safety is not crashing into the ceiling or the floor. So here our reachable set is an aerodynamic flight envelope, which starts to um, prune away the control action of the vehicle as it gets close to the ceiling or it gets close to the floor. Uh, so we pre-computed that set based on a model of the system, and then we took away the model of the system. We said, learn your own control law to track a desired trajectory. We're only going to give you this envelope. Okay, so it's kind of an artificial example, but we wanted to explore what would happen or how, how we could guarantee that vehicle to maintain safety while learning how to control itself. So it had to learn its own parameters of its model again. Okay, so it first drops to the ground. That makes sense because it doesn't have a control law. But it doesn't hit the ground. It hits the bottom of the envelope. Remember, from reachability, it just applies the control which keeps it on the envelope. In fact, it sort of bounces up and down off the envelope. And, um, and that bouncing up and down is important because it kind of learns that if it applies this thrust, it goes up. So after about a minute, it does a really good job of tracking the desired trajectory. It learns that. We're using a very simple, um, well, simple now that everybody knows how to do it, but it wasn't simple when they did it, this um, policy gradient sign derivative uh, function. And so, you know, I think to end, I'm just going to skip these last few slides and, and end on this one video. What we've been really interested in asking now is, as we learn these disturbance functions more, how do we use that to update the envelope? So in the previous video, we just kept the envelope constant. So suppose you learn that the system is, um, you know, you, what you thought was the envelope was actually wrong and it should be more conservative. And so what we did in this experiment was um, to that same sort of scenario, we introduced a big fan. Okay, so here's Ken A, and he's turning on this big industrial fan, which produces a big disturbance in the bottom part of the room that wasn't used in the original model. So the quad rotor doesn't know about this, it's sort of coming up and down. And now you'll see, we did two experiments, and you'll see them, one of them ghosted out. So the, um, the ghost is what happens if we don't update the envelope based on the learned disturbance function. Whereas the, the non-ghosted one is when we update the envelope based on the learned disturbance function. So what is it doing intuitively? It shrinks the envelope. It's, it's measuring the disturbance as it goes down. And it realizes that you know, these are disturbances that are way out of bounds from what I used for the original computation of the reachable set. So I'm going to shrink back to the set, to the level set, to the point at which the disturbance matches what I had in my original model. And, and so it does that. It's, I mean, it's a very conservative way of maintaining safety. But then as it's, it's a Bayesian mechanism, and as it samples that boundary, if we turned off the fan, it would gradually grow that set bigger. Okay, so that's what I meant, like sort of first steps towards thinking about how you integrate data-driven methods into, or one way to integrate data-driven methods into a safety paradigm like this. Okay, so we, we talked about learning while staying safe. We talked about safety, we spent some time talking about reachability analysis, a little bit about a hybrid system representation. Um, and then we ended by talking about how you might uh, one way to update this information based on data that you're gathering in real time. So there's a whole bunch of questions that are, I mean, this is a, I think it's a, a wonderful area to work in, but there are a whole bunch of questions to work on. Um, so how you, how you update those sets is something that we're working on. How do you model unstructured environments? I mean, these were fa fairly um, benign disturbances that we were looking here. Um, but what do you do? Um, what, what's a kind of better control paradigm in unstructured environments? And Maybe we should be thinking more along the lines of risk-sensitive reachability. So, um, 
you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of our colleagues, but we also stand on the shoulders of our students and uh, postdocs and people we've worked with. And um, uh, I've had a, a wonderful opportunity to work with uh, a wonderful group of students and postdocs. This is um, the, the subset of those who um, have worked on these um, problems that I presented today. Uh, this, the folks in bold are still are here, uh, very much working on these problems that we presented, and um, and others like Alex have, you know, they're in uh, other places or Alex is here, uh, working on uh, their own careers now. So, thank you very much.